So what do you do when you're black but your opponent's only playing for a draw? That's the situation in this fourth game. So go get yourself an ice pot from the freezer and let's go. What do you mean you've not got any ice pops? What are you doing with your life? Anyway, let's get on with the game. So Bobby Fisher's in Argentina. He's playing somebody called Herman Pulnik. I think that's how I pronounce it. Anyway, it don't matter really. Let's carry on. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to what Larry Evans in the introduction, who writes all the notes for the game's calls, a very sort of tame, dull, boring opening. Uh, but this bishop e2 line Karpov played this with great success i used to play this as well and you know it's fine but it's okay i think the idea behind this because it's in slay the uh, the sicilian by tim somebody and he says you know bishop e2 on move six he recommends this for the club player to get a strategic game throw a black out of book and things like that and just play a normal chess game so i think it's got its merits uh, myself, uh, Larry. So, you know, anyway, let's carry on. So, yeah, okay, maybe it's a bit of a tame moment, but the idea is that, you know, you're probably going to be playing for D5 if White can do that. And it's the normal Sicilian stuff. It's not like a Sicilian dragon where things are absolutely chaotic. It's a slower opening, it's more strategic. And Fisher. Uh, I think he's right in saying that White's actually playing for a draw in this game. He doesn't really seem to try to drum up much of an attack. And I think that is difficult when, you know, I, I have this quite a lot when I'm, I'm trying to play for a win, but my opponents are sort of taking pieces off the board. They're not playing shot variations. It's t entirely up to the opponent how they want to play it. They can play for a draw and you have to just try and complicate things, keep material on the board and just generally try to mix things up a bit. So the game continued. Rook to d1 b5 typical sicilian stuff rook d2 knight b6 and then fisher notes this move as a mistake right and it's a really interesting series of moves actually because he notes this as a mistake because he says that black should just take off the knight immediately right because the danger is for knight c4 is pretty strong for black and he gives this following example or well, it gives a few variations but i'm just looking at this one for example how uh Black can take over the game from this point of view. Obviously, getting rid of the knight on d5. Knight f6, and then we have tactical ideas with rook b8 and things like this. So he says knight c4 would have been a big threat in the position. So Black should have taken the knight off at this stage. However, and this is the important point, Fischer then doesn't move the knight and Black play knight c4. He plays rook b8, right, allowing the knight to be taken anyway. Uh, because he says in the book that the fact that White didn't take the knight in this move suggested that he wouldn't play it on this move. So he's, probably, he's trying to sort of play, play the sort of psychological game there, but I'm not really sure why he would play rook b8. I mean, he must have been really positive that his opponent wouldn't have taken, but his opponent did take. So I always like think, well, play the best moves, but he obviously thought he wouldn't take the, the, the knight the second time. But there we go. He does, and he did. And knight d5 came. Takes, takes. Which sort of forces the exchange of pieces. But black's got the bishop pair. And maybe you could sort of drum up something with that. I mean, I don't like this pawn at the moment. But at least it's stopping this one. And, uh, you know, the rook's okay. But it's not ideally placed on, on b6, I wouldn't have thought. So black's got a little bit of reorganising to do. But overall, this is fairly solid for, for both players. f4. Bishop coming to f6, c3, just blunt in this c file, makes sense. From the black's point of view, could always reorganize or play something like this. So blunt in the c file. And also, if pawn takes, bishop takes, that makes sense as well. So reorganization from Fisher and bishop, we do get bishop e5. And black is probably slightly better. But it's still pretty difficult to drum up a win. 
challenges the pawns. Opening up the C file now does make sense. So we get immediate rook C2, pinning against uh, the queen, potentially. So this is what I mean by sort of mixing things up a little bit. I mean, you know, an opponent at this level is not going to make tactical mistakes. I want to sort of like move the rook across or something like that, just dropping a piece. But, uh, you know, for amateur players, I think playing moves like this, you know, maybe going after this pawn as well at some point. So, yeah, I think, I think you've got to do things like that, try and mix things up a little bit. Uh, and then this move takes queens come off the board. So Fisher was happy to exchange queens in this situation. Interesting. So you would have thought naturally to try to keep the queens on, but maybe was also worried about potential pressure down the F file. I'm not sure. He just goes in and he allows the exchange of queens. But what we do have is this pawn to go at, right? So this pawn's pretty weak, and we've got three versus two on the king's side. So maybe he's got his eye on the end game in this position because it should be fairly easy to round up this pawn and tie up white's pieces, especially with the bishop. So it's not surprising that knight took the bishop. But in this case, Fish actually calls this a mistake because now we've got a very strong e pawn. And we've got obviously can support it with the f pawn as well. So now we've got advantage to black as long as we can keep an eye on this pawn. Right, this one's going, I think, at some point. But this pawn could be dangerous. We've got a light squared bishop, so could, we can hang on to it. But like I say, black's pawns are probably stronger than this pawn, and that uh, worked out in the game, as we shall soon see. So, rook protecting pawns, rook onto the uh, second rank just makes sense. Obviously, you get a rook on the second or the seventh, it's always going to be strong. Whoops. So, good move by Fisher, which gives himself an exclam for. Mm, G4. Wow, that's quite. Sort of risky, but let's have a look. And this pawn now is, I mean, this is a good move in theory because we're hitting the rook and we're moving the pawn, but this pawn can be rounded up and it gets rounded up fairly quickly. And yeah. So black takes the pawn for pawn, but now, you know, we're going to round this one up. And again, we've got the three versus the two. So this is advantage for black in the end game. And we've got a nice move coming up here. Can you find a nice way to sort of take material off the board? Bang! Right, take the bishop because we have the pin. And this is all over now. We can take this pawn, that's fine, but resigns at this position because what we're going to get is you know exchange of material let's let's say whose move is it now why nine f rook f4 right bishop can just drop back maintain the pin g1 and then we can eventually just get a trade and we've just got the extra piece so that's just going to be enough to win for Fisher. So that's it. And so nothing much about that game. Just, I think, you know, slight advantage Fisher was able to, to take advantage of in the end game. And he just kind of whipped up that win from nowhere, really. So yeah, thanks for watching and let's keep going with the series.